For the past few years, TikTok, for better or for worse, has been instrumental in popularizing certain trends and fads, such as Stanley Cups, insane home improvement projects, and the latest iteration of the SFM videos I used to watch in 2015. What's my girl Kate Bush doing here? It's also been responsible for the recent rise of romance novels thanks to the popularity of BookTok, the community of book enthusiasts on the app. If you've read some of the romance books that are popular on this side of TikTok, you might have noticed that some of them feel a little familiar. It's almost like these characters are from something else. That's because all these books were originally fanfiction. It seems that more and more books are getting published each year that were originally posted online as fanfiction. As someone who loves books and all things fan culture, this pipeline is very interesting to me, so I wanted to take a closer look. Is publishing fanfiction a good thing, or does it mark the downfall of the publishing industry as we know it? As usual in my videos, I want to give a brief overview of fanfiction and its history so that we're all on the same page. The most basic definition of fanfiction is writing based on an existing work of fiction, such as a TV show, movie, or book, or occasionally real people such as actors, musicians, YouTubers, and the like. Fan fiction as we know it today began, as most things in fandom did, in the 60s with the Star Trek fandom. Fans of the show created and distributed zines filled with their own original stories featuring Captain Kirk and the Enterprise crew. However, the phenomenon of writers basing their stories on pre-existing works dates back much further than this. For instance, many of Shakespeare's plays were based on other stories or real historical figures. It could be argued that Virgil's Aeneid is fan fiction of the Iliad, or that Dante's Divine Comedy is Bible fan fiction. With the advent of the internet, fanfic became even more popular. Initially, fics were shared via forums, email lists, or fan-made websites dedicated to specific fandoms or pairings. Eventually, websites solely dedicated to fanfiction sprang up, like fanfiction.net, an archive of our own, aka AO3. Fanfiction has historically been looked down upon by the literary community due to the assumption that it is poorly written, unoriginal, and lacking in creativity. I feel like when a lot of people think of fanfiction, they think of something like My Immortal, even though that was very obviously a troll fic in my opinion. Personally, I don't subscribe to this belief at all. I've been reading and writing fanfic since I was 13, and while I have come across some My Immortals in my time, I've also read a lot of wonderfully creative fics by writers who clearly have a lot of talent. Regardless of quality, I think fanfiction is a fun and relatively harmless way to practice writing and connect with other people in the fandom you're writing for. And yeah, I'm gonna say it. I think a lot of criticism leveled at fanfiction stems from misogyny. According to one survey, 80% of AO3 users identify as female, and some people in this world hate nothing more than to see a woman having a good time. Considering how popular fanfiction has become, AO3 alone has over 12 million works and 62,000 fandoms posted by 6.5 million users as of the first of this year, it's not surprising that many published authors today started out as fanfic writers. The lines between fanfiction and published fiction are steadily becoming more blurred. Fanfiction isn't typically monetized due to copyright laws. Authors understandably don't want to be served a cease and desist from Disney or whoever. Fanfiction already occupies a bit of a legal gray area. Some argue its transformative nature means it falls under fair use, while certain creators of works fanfiction is based upon allege that it infringes on their copyright. Despite this, published fanfiction has a surprisingly long and storied history. Some examples of historic works that could be considered fanfiction include Powers of Darkness, an 1899 unauthorized Swedish adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Old Friends and New Fancies by Sybil G. Brinton, a 1913 novel based on the works of Jane Austen, and Wide Sargasso Sea by Jean Rhys a 1966 prequel to Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. In 2009, a Swedish author writing under the pen name J.D. California was sued by J.D. Salinger for writing an unauthorized sequel to Catcher in the Rye, thus preventing his book from being published in the United States. Swedes love copyright infringement, apparently. Fanfiction really started popping off online in the 2010s, and in 2013, Amazon tried to get their grubby little hands on it to turn a profit. They established a service called Kindle Worlds, where writers could publish their fanfiction. 
given that said fanfiction was based on one of the small number of media properties Amazon had a licensing agreement with, and was approved by the creators of said property. The revenue would be shared among the author, the licensee, and Amazon. This venture didn't end up being as successful as Amazon had evidently hoped, and it was shut down just five years later in 2018. Sorry that there wasn't a huge market for fanfiction based on the works of guy you were forced to read in high school, unless there's a huge Kurt Vonnegut fandom out there that I'm not aware of. Contemporary authors were gonna have to take a slightly different approach if they wanted to publish their fanfiction without getting sued. Some of them realized that they could simply file the serial numbers off. That is, tweak their pre-existing fanfics to remove anything that associated it with the work it was based on, such as by changing character names or setting it in an alternate universe, and remove all traces of the original fanfic from the internet and no one would be any the wiser. When people talk about books that were once fanfics, there seem to be four particular books that come up repeatedly, so let's talk about them. The Mortal Instruments is a series of YA urban fantasy novels by author Cassandra Clare. It follows a teenage girl named Clary Frey who discovers she has powers that link her to a group of demon hunters called the Shadow Hunters. The first book, City of Bones, published in 2007, was adapted into a movie, and the series was later adapted into a TV show. If you grew up in the late 2000s and early 2010s like me and liked books, you've almost certainly at least heard of this series. They were always front and center in the YA section of chapters, although I somehow managed to avoid ever reading one myself. What you may not know, however, is that Cassandra Clare got her start writing Harry Harry Potter fanfiction. She was a huge name in the online Potter fandom in the early 2000s, where she went by the name Cassie Clare with an I. Her fanfics amassed significant notoriety. The most well known of them was the Draco Trilogy, a series that centered around a love triangle between Draco Malfoy, Hermione Granger, and Harry Potter. If you're interested in hearing more about that, David M has a series of videos recapping each part of the series in truly painstaking detail. She became a bit of a controversial figure in the fandom, being accused of things like like plagiarism and cyberbullying, but we're not going to get too deep into Cassandra Clare lore in this video because that's a whole thing in itself. It's a common misconception that The Mortal Instruments was directly based on the Draco trilogy, but this isn't technically the case. The overall plots of the two are quite different, but Claire did recycle some elements of the Draco trilogy for The Mortal Instruments, such as the love triangle. TMI also features people who have supernatural powers, non-magical people are called mundanes or mundies, very clearly inspired by the term muggles, and the character of Jace is obviously based on Claire's version of Draco Malfoy. Interestingly, TMI shares a name with another of Claire's fanfics, Mortal Instruments, about an incestuous relationship between Ron and Ginny Weasley. Yeah. TMI isn't based on this fic either, although Claire did make the choice to carry over the themes of incest for some reason. In the 2000s, fanfiction was very much a niche underground thing, tucked away in obscure corners of the internet and not looked upon particularly favorably by the publisher industry. Cassandra Clare clearly wanted to be taken more seriously as an author, so she tried to distance herself from her past as a fanfic writer. She removed the Draco trilogy and all of her other work from the internet, although it has been re-uploaded by others many times over the years, and slightly tweaked her pen name so that nothing from her fandom days would come up if you googled her. And it seemed to work for a while. I had no idea about her association with fanfiction until like a few years ago when YouTube videos on the topic started cropping up. Given just how massive the Harry Potter franchise and its associated fandom is, it's kind of surprising that there aren't more books lifted from Harry Potter fanfic out there. The only other Potter fanfic writer turned published author I'm aware of is Rainbow Rowell. She is admitted to writing Drary fanfic, that is Draco and Harry, and her novel Fangirl is about a college student who writes a popular fanfiction about the Simon Snow series, clearly meant to be this universe's version of Harry Potter, featuring a relationship between the title character and his rival, Baz Pitch. Sound familiar? This fictional fanfiction, called Carry On, was then turned into a novel of its own by Rowell. What may have been the first ever published novel to be directly adapted from a fanfiction that was once posted online, or at least the first one to really blow up, was Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Published in 2011, it's an erotic romance novel about a college student named Anastasia Steele, who enters a relationship centered around BDSM with rich businessman Christian Grey. It became a runaway hit, sparking a series of follow-up novels and subsequent film adaptations. It set a record in the UK as the fastest selling paperback of all time, and apparently sold more copies than any singular book in the Harry Potter series. 
It's now common knowledge that this book was once a Twilight fanfiction. It was originally titled Master of the Universe, and Anastasia Steele and Christian Grey were Bella Swan and Edward Cullen, respectively. E.L. James posted it on fanfiction.net in 2009 under the name Snow Queen Ice Dragon, but it was apparently too spicy for that site, so she took it down and re-uploaded it on her own website. She decided to self-publish the book in 2011 and went about filing the serial numbers off. It quickly grew in popularity and was picked up by a publisher. Apparently even Stephanie Meyer, the author of the Twilight books, gave it her stamp of approval, which kind of surprises me because that woman is Mormon. Girl, did you read the book? Despite being successful commercially, Fifty Shades was less successful critically. It was panned for its poor writing and convoluted plot. And while a lot of these critics were just people who wanted to laugh at the idea of middle-aged women bringing cucumbers into the movie theater, some of these criticisms were warranted. Members of the BDSM community spoke out about the book's inaccurate and problematic portrayal of BDSM practices. The release of the books allegedly coincided with an uptick in sex toy related injuries. It is also insinuated that Christian's interest in BDSM stems from his childhood SA. Lastly, the book has been called out for romanticizing the relationship dynamic between Anna and Christian that is at best unhealthy and at worst emotionally abusive. While Fifty Shades was still very much looked down upon by the literary snobs of the world, I think this is when publishers started to realize just how lucrative fanfiction could be. I mean, this series was a phenomenon, and it's been credited with sparking a renaissance in erotic romance that we are still seeing the consequences of today. While by far the most popular, Fifty Shades is not the only published Twilight fanfiction. Others include Beautiful Bastard by Christina Lauren and Semper by J.M. Darhauer. The next big fanfic to book sensation was Anna Todd's After in 2014. It is a YA romance novel about Tessa Young, a freshman in college who begins a relationship with bad boy Hardin Scott. As with Fifty Shades of Grey, it was followed by multiple sequels and film adaptations. It was adapted from a fanfiction of the same name that Todd posted on Wattpad under the name Imaginator 1D. However, unlike the fics we've talked about so far, this one wasn't based on a work of fiction. In the original After, Hardin Scott was real-life human man, Harry Styles. This is also the only fic we're going to discuss today that I was actually aware of before it was published. I haven't read it, but I was on the outskirts of the One Direction fandom when it was being posted on Wattpad, and I had Twitter mutuals who talked about it like it was War and Peace. The book drew comparisons to Fifty Shades of Grey, not only because it was based on a fanfiction, but also because it wasn't particularly well written, and the relationship between the two main characters was concerning, to say the least. It portrays Harry Styles slash Hardin Scott as a tattooed rebel with a fiery temper, a depiction of Harry that was common in One Direction fan works for some reason, despite nothing about Harry's public persona suggesting that he's like that. I mean, this is what he looked like while After was being written. He just looks like a polite young man who'd tell your father that he'll have you home by nine. Anyways, Tessa and Harry slash Harden basically do nothing but fight and fuck for four novels. Another common criticism was that the characters were pretty shallow. This isn't surprising given that After was once a fanfic. Since readers are already familiar with the people or characters, fic writers don't usually have to spend a lot of time on characterization, but this doesn't carry over well into original fiction. Ultimately, I just wonder what Harry Styles himself thinks about all this. Like, the poor man has already had to endure being harassed by Larry Shippers for over a decade, and now he has to walk into a movie theater and see young Lord Voldemort playing a character that was based on him. The Love Hypothesis is a romance novel published in 2021 by Ali Hazelwood. It was originally a Raylo fanfic, that is, Rey and Kylo Ren from the Star Wars sequel movies, posted on AO3 titled Head Over Feet under the username EverSoRaylo. Rey and Kylo Ren were renamed Olive Smith and Adam Carlson in the published version, and the illustration on the front cover strongly resembles Daisy Ridley and Adam Driver, the actors who portray the Star Wars characters. Evidently all pretense has gone out the window at this point. The filing off of the serial numbers clearly was a mere formality to avoid getting sued by one of the biggest media corporations in the world. Now I have to admit that I've been talking a lot of shit about these books so far despite not having read any of them or the fanfics they were based on. It didn't feel quite right to make a video judging books based on fanfiction when I haven't actually read any books based on fanfiction, 
So I decided for this video that's what I was going to do. Unlike the previous books we have discussed, The Love Hypothesis actually received mostly positive reviews from readers and critics alike, so that's the book I chose to read. I wanted to check it out from the library, support your local libraries, kids, but the waiting list for it was like months long, which I guess I should have anticipated, so I ended up getting the Kindle ebook version because I wasn't about to drop $30 on a physical copy. I tried my best to remove my hater hat going into this. I wanted to like it, I really did, I was truly hoping that it would live up to the hype, but uh, spoiler alert, it was kind of ass. That's just my opinion though. This is no shade toward Allie Hazelwood or anyone who enjoyed the book. But I'll go over a few of the problems I had with it. So the book is told from the perspective of Olive, a third year biology PhD student at Stanford. She would recently broke up with a guy named Jeremy who she wasn't really that into. Her best friend, Ahn, now likes him but refuses to go out with him because she's convinced Olive isn't over him. To convince Ahn that she is indeed over him, she lies and says that she started seeing someone else. We'll soon see that dishonesty will become a bit of a trend with Olive. She's working in the lab on an evening when she had told Ahn that she would be out on a date, but runs into Ahn there, so in order to avoid being caught in her lie, she kisses the nearest passerby, who happens to be Dr. Adam Carlson, the brooding, hypercritical professor who works in her department that all the grad students are afraid of. I feel like I should point out that kissing someone without their consent is like sexual harassment, but luckily for all of, I guess Dr. Carlson was into it. Many jokes were made about him filing a Title IX complaint, which I didn't love, but however. Once Olive explains herself to him, they decide to pretend to date each other for the next month. This arrangement will supposedly benefit them both, Olive because it will convince Ahn to go after Jeremy, and Adam because it will convince the university to unfreeze his research funds for some convoluted reason. Goofy ass premise that really requires you to suspend your disbelief, which frankly I struggled to do. The first half of the book was a bit of a slog to get through because it was just kind of boring. Olive and Adam are forced into a bunch of awkward situations to build up sexual tension between them, like Olive having to sit on his lap in an overcrowded lecture hall. Very professional of them. As they spend more time with each other to keep up the charade, of course, they end up developing real feelings for each other. About halfway through, the characters all attend a science conference in Boston, and Olive and Adam are sharing a hotel room. Olive gives a talk at this conference, after which she is sexually harassed and threatened by Adam's friend and research partner Tom Benton. This came a little out of left field for me because this character had been portrayed pretty affably before this. And I do commend the author for trying to address sexism in STEM fields, but the way the misogyny from this character was written felt a little too heavy-handed or on the nose for me. Olive is understandably upset by this, but she gets over it pretty quick because Adam returns to their hotel room and they start fucking. They still don't confess their feelings for one another though, and Olive is actually convinced he's in love with another woman. Like, girl, he just ate your coochie. Am I allowed to say that on here? The next day, Olive decides to fake break up with her fake boyfriend and never see him again until she realizes that she had accidentally recorded Tom accosting her the day prior, and thus has evidence that she can use to report him. She goes to Adam with the proof, and he flies into a rage and tries to beat Tom's ass in the middle of a restaurant. Tom loses his job, Olive and Adam finally confess their feelings to each other, and they live happily ever after. Yay! The first thing that really took me out of this book was how unrealistic a lot of it was. I know romance novels are supposed to be like escapist fantasies and not be taken too seriously, but I don't know, it still bothered me. I'm not convinced that fake dating is something that anyone actually does outside of fan fiction, certainly not two grown ass adults in academia. I don't even really like this trope in fan fiction that much. But I don't know, maybe I just have a stick up my ass and hate fun. The way the conflict with Tom was resolved also felt a little too convenient for me. Unfortunately, I don't think actual cases of sexual harassment within academia usually get resolved that quickly or neatly, if they get resolved at all. And this brings me to another pretty major ick I had with the novel. As I'm sure you've noticed, this is a student-teacher romance. Yes, I know they're both consenting adults, and the book does try to hand wave this by saying their relationship doesn't break any university rules because Adam isn't Olive's direct supervisor. 
In the comments of a Reads with Rachel video about a different Allie Hazelwood book, this user said that they have a PhD in a STEM discipline and that they found the relationship in the love hypothesis concerning because even though Adam isn't Olive's professor, he's still someone who has a lot of authority in her workplace that she doesn't have. There's an inherent power imbalance here that shouldn't be ignored. I've never been a grad student, but I'm inclined to agree with this commenter. And what's more, Hazelwood should have been well aware of this given that she was once a PhD student and is currently a professor. Yes, that's right. Allie Hazelwood, which is not her real name, is a neuroscience professor. Man, I took a neuroscience class in university and I can't imagine like going to write a midterm after staying up all night memorizing the parts of the brain. Meanwhile, my professor is on AO3 writing Raylo fanfiction. Another thing I wasn't a fan of was the writing style. It's hard for me to put my finger on what exactly I didn't like about it, other than that it just felt very fanfiction-y. I'm sure anyone who's read a lot of fanfiction will have an idea of what I'm talking about. Like, every character has this quirky way of speaking that felt like they were in a sitcom. Or the Star Wars sequel movies. Oh, they fly now! They fly now? They fly now! We got a lot of the classic, oh, 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 oh. Say oh. again. Say oh. again. I dare you. I double dare you, motherfucker. Say oh. one more goddamn time. And there was a science joke or pun every other line, practically. Some of them were funny, but it was starting to wear on me towards the end. Their narration was also obsessed with letting us know how huge Adam was in comparison to Olive. His two character traits were basically grumpy and big. Maybe this would have made sense if Olive was like five foot nothing and Adam was Jacob Alordi, but it's explicitly stated that Olive is five foot eight, and if Adam was based on Adam Driver, he's six foot two. That's not that big of a height difference. Overall, the writing just felt a little juvenile. I was even a bit taken aback when we got to the fairly explicit sex scene because I had forgotten that I wasn't reading a YA novel. My final major issue with this book was that it heavily featured one of my least favorite tropes, and that is characters that don't fucking communicate. The entire premise of the story is predicated on a lie, and Olive constantly lies to everyone. Like, how can anyone stand this bitch? I get that we needed a reason for the characters to not get together until the end, but I wish authors would start finding better ways of doing this. One thing I will give the novel credit for is that I actually didn't mind the sex scenes. Sex scenes in fanfiction and even some published romance novels are notorious for being cringy and unrealistic, but the ones in the love hypothesis actually didn't make me want to die, so thanks for that, Allie. But yeah, this book just wasn't it for me. I tried, but romance novels based on fanfiction just aren't my thing, I fear. Even though this book was only published in 2021, Ali Hazelwood has put out several more books since then. As far as I'm aware, none of them are based on Raylo fanfiction, although they apparently feature a lot of the same tropes as The Love Hypothesis. Her most recent book, a YA novel called Check and Mate, features characters that are apparently based on real-life chess player's Magnus Carlsen, hmm, where have we seen that surname before, and Anna Cramling, as well as Timothy Chalamet for some reason, which sort of makes it seem like we've circled back around to writing fanfiction with the intention of getting it published. Something else I noticed in my research was that there are a lot of published Raylo fics, like way more than any other ship or fandom. I have no idea why this is, but if you have any theories, feel free to let me know in the comments. Although I have enjoyed reading and writing fanfiction for more than a decade, published novels based on fanfiction don't really work for me. I think this is because with fanfiction, I already know and love the characters and want to read about them having new adventures or exploring relationships that weren't explored in the original work. Therefore, I find I'm more willing to overlook things like minor grammatical errors or amateurish writing, especially since I'm going in with the expectation that these are likely not professional writers writing these stories, and they may not have been edited or beta read. However, with original fiction, the author needs to work a bit harder to establish who their characters are, to make them compelling and ensure the reader cares about them. And this is where one of the major problems with published fanfiction stems from. As a reader, when coming into a novel without having read the fanfic it's based on, or maybe not even knowing that it was based on one, you're lacking the knowledge that this character is meant to be Edward Cullen from 
Twilight or Kylo Ren from Star Wars. If the author hasn't put in the work to characterize them, they can come off as feeling flat or bland. I think this is especially noticeable with the female protagonists. We've already established that the majority of fanfic enjoyers are women, but when looking specifically at fanfic featuring male-female relationships, I would say that number becomes even closer to 100%. In a lot of these kinds of fics, the female character, whether canon or OC, functions as a self-insert so the author and or reader can live out their fantasies of being with the Blorbo of their desire. And I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with this. Zero judgment here, I've been posted up in the Steve Harrington slash original female character tag on AO3. But this does mean that the female character is often either a blank slate for the reader to project themselves onto, or weirdly similar to the author, which may not always translate well into original fiction. Another issue with publishing fanfiction is that a lot of fanfiction contains potentially harmful tropes, such as student-teacher romances. Fifty Shades and After were both criticized for romanticizing toxic relationship dynamics. These tropes are typically used to either create drama or angst to further the plot, or as a means to explore the writer's fantasies, because yeah, maybe sometimes we do fantasize about being sold to One Direction as a sex slave. Doesn't necessarily mean we want it to happen in real life, though. I don't think this is too much of a problem within insular online fanfiction communities because many of the writers are young and inexperienced, and these communities provide a safe space for them to explore their fantasies and practice their writing. But once you introduce that fanfiction to a more general audience, things become a bit stickier. That's not to say that authors should never include sensitive subjects like abusive relationships in their work. They just need to be careful not to portray them in an idealized manner, because this can have real-life consequences especially if they're writing for a younger and more impressionable audience. One thing that worries me about fanfiction starting to become more mainstream is that it'll end up being over-commodified. I think we're already seeing this a little bit. With the explosion of book talk and the popularity of books like The Love Hypothesis, big publishers are waking up to the fact that the medium they looked down upon all these years might actually be incredibly profitable. I wouldn't be surprised if they're now flocking to AO3 to scout the next literary sensation. I've also seen people accuse romance authors of starting to write stories based solely around popular tropes rather than original ideas or meaningful plots, which I feel is common in a lot of fanfiction. I mean, look at this promotional image for the book Fangirl Down. These are literally AO3 tags. Peach emoji? What does that even mean in this context? Maybe some people genuinely enjoy reading books like this, but personally if I'm in the mood to read a guilty pleasure romance story full of ridiculous and unrealistic tropes with zero semblance of a comprehensible plot, I'd rather just find one for free online that features characters I already know I like. And lastly, I want to address a glaring issue with published fanfiction that you may have noticed by now. They're all Raylo. Nah, I'm just kidding. But they are almost all about white, heterosexual couples, when anyone in fanfiction community knows that this is not reflective of what the majority of ships featured in fanfiction are. Let's take a look at this list of the top 100 pairings on AO3 for the year of 2022, shall we? As we can clearly see, the majority of the pairings on this list are male-male. Assuming my math is correct, only 17% of this list is male-female romantic pairings. Raylo aren't even fucking on the list. You know who is? Naruto Sasuke, coming in at number 94. There are a significant number of Asian pairings because anime and K-pop are very popular right now, but we are not seeing any of this representation reflected in the fanfic that gets published. Part of why fanfiction is able to explore certain themes or provide representation to marginalized groups is because it is niche and not-for-profit, and it would be a shame if it ends up being whitewashed to cater to the tastes of the very white and cis-heteronormative publishing industry. TLDW, I really like reading and writing both original fiction and fanfiction, and I don't think that one is better than the other. However, I am a little wary of the two starting to cross over because, ultimately, I think they are two different mediums that serve two different purposes. Feel free to disagree with me, though. I am interested to hear other people's perspectives on the matter. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, liking and subscribing would be very much appreciated. I'll catch y'all in the next one. Nothing quite like slurping some balls.